Once again, to, it'll be right in the 90s, the show that still hasn't forgiven its dad for getting them a second-hand copy of Diddy Kong Racing with no instructions, instead of Super Mario 64 for Christmas in 1998. <laughs> uh, my name's Stu Josden, and joining me, as always, is Alex Greenwood. Greeny, how are you, mate? Uh, uh, yes, I'm all right, thanks. I'm, I'm getting in the Christmas spirit by um, staving off uh, COVID and its, its Christmassy strand. Uh, yes. But apart from that, I am, um, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I, I'm, I generally quite like Christmas. So uh, what about you? How are good you? Good man. Good man. Well, talking of illness, um, I, I, I'll, I'll mention it now, seeing as it's on the, on the menu. I've, uh, I've been under the weather for the last few days. Uh, regular listeners might notice this in my voice, uh, but it's nothing, it's nothing, uh, nothing serious. You'll be happy to hear. And I'm, I'm coming out the other side of it now. I'm well enough to uh, record this special Christmas episode of the pod tonight. But uh, yeah, looking forward to the festivities. A uh, couple of weeks off coming up, which I'm looking forward to. So uh, yeah, yeah, all ready to go. Have you finished your shopping? Um, almost. Yeah, almost. I, I'm, I'm trying to mix it up um, with a bit of online shopping, but I always try and go to the high street as much as possible because that is obviously the most 90s way you can Christmas shop is to... Actually, probably the most 90s way you can Christmas shop is probably the Littlewoods catalogue or... Um, something along those lines but um yeah not quite have you have you got everything now of course yeah just about just about uh did a lot of wrapping at the weekend so uh yeah we're on we're on uh and that oh. also actually nicely brings me on to uh this week's sponsor uh which is which is tied in with our seasonal episode um we are sponsored this week very generously by summerfield caution uh and they're there for all of your christmas food shopping needs this year uh, at the moment it's one pound off selected potatoes uh, ham on the bone at half price and uh, fresh top side of beef available at one pound eighty eight per pound. Uh, so that's price check at Summersfield savings that add up. So uh, there you go. If you just pop down and there's no no even no need to mention all right 90s code this time. Just go yeah. in there. Those prices are available for everybody. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah. yeah, of course, I remember the days when it was Gateway. The uh, yes, of the, course, the, um, the previous incarnation of those Summerfields. Um, do you remember when um Apologies, listeners who aren't from Caution or didn't grow up in Caution. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, do, do, you remember, <laughs> do you remember when there were two gateways um, sort of on either side of the shopping precinct? Yeah, and one, the other one was where the factory shop is now. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. What was that all about? Why were there two supermarkets? And when I say the other side of the shopping precinct, I'm not talking about Cabot Circus in, in Bristol or um, the Bullring in Birmingham. You know, this, is, mm-hmm. this was a tiny place. This was literally come out of one door and there'll be the yeah. other gateway there what on i the don't understand what was going on there i'm not too sure i'm not too sure to be honest i'll have to uh, i'll have to go back and maybe i can ask my folks maybe they'll know uh but yeah i also remember before gateway i think it was just called quite simply international because oh. because my gran uh 102 still with us fantastic um she she always referred to it as international, even when it was even when it was Summerfield in like the, uh, you yeah. know, in in the in the mid to late two thousands when she was still going down there for her shopping, it was still the international. So, uh, yeah, no, we'll have to look into that peculiarity in uh, in town planning. I think. Yeah, any caution town planners, please do get in contact. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, let us know. Let us know. <laughs> Um, I think we've got some uh, post bag coming up later on in the show, which is reflective of the topic of this week's, obviously, uh, seasonal episode. So we won't go into that at the moment. But I do have one uh, piece of correspondence arising from our last episode on cult 90s footballers. But this was to do with our what's the most 90s section where we discuss the uh, most 90s fashion accessory. Uh, and it comes from uh, my wife, Beth. And uh, I asked her what she thought the most 90s fashion accessory was. And she simply said, butterfly clips. Uh, yeah, and I said, well, I said, can I use that for the pod? She said, yes. I said, do you want to come on the pod and talk about it yourself? She said, no. I said, what are butterfly clips? She said, look it up. So that, that, so that was all I got. Um, yeah. I've, given, I've given them a quick search and it literally does appear to be a hair clip in the shape of a butterfly. Uh, and, that, and that's it. 
so I, I must say I don't have much of a recollection of this. Um, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know if you do. I'm not... um, well, as soon as you said it, um, I I kind of thought I knew what it was. Um, that said, I am going to now Google it just to remind, well, just to confirm that I do know what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that, yeah, I knew that. Yeah, yeah, very nineties. Good choice, Beth. Well, there we go. I'm, I'm hoping to get her more, more involved, you know, with uh, with the pod as we go on. So maybe we can talk about our, uh, maybe we can talk about our this week's what's the most nineties and see what she thinks about that as well. Yeah, the the door is ajar with correspondence. <laughs> I feel indeed. It's it's a slow, uh, you know, it's a slow burner, but I'm getting in there. Yeah, um, I should have said this actually before we started the correspondence. This I do have one quick correction um, from a previous episode. Um, mm-hmm from the previous episode actually the Colt 11 a uh, tiny little thing uh, I refer to Spain and Yugoslavia playing a 4-4 draw at World Cup 98 yes it was actually 4-3 to Spain and it was at Euro 2000 and that's it I just ah, okay. it was niggling at me and I felt like I had to say something no yeah, one's yeah. going to care about that I don't think anyone else probably remembers a game but um, you know I had to get it out there so well like, here's the thing my apologies. if we're clearing the air there, there's something that I have to mention uh-oh. I I did a bit more uh, research into my back line uh, because, again, there was something that was niggling at me. Mm. And uh, Frank Yallop, Wallop from Yallop, star, star of my team so far, who it could be argued, yeah. who I've got in at left back. Yeah. He's right sided. Oh. I've made, oh. I've made such an error here. And, and I, I, I even think, I even think he was a right midfielder. He's not, not even <laughs> a right back. So, out of position. <laughs> so, so I've got a right midfielder playing at left back. So whoever you've got playing on the right wing in your side is going to have an absolute field day. <laughs> yeah. Any Ipswich fans listening, if if they ever saw Frank Callop playing at left back, I haven't managed to uncover any uh, evidence to suggest that he did. But please, if if you've got anything, let us know because otherwise, I might have to make a hasty. Um, I might have to make a hasty change on the team sheet. Yeah. Far be it from us to talk about football uh, in the present day, it's well, well uh, outside our remit, but it was the Joslyn Greenwood derby yesterday evening, oh, God, uh, yeah. <laughs> which, end, which ended in a positive result for me and a not so positive result for you. No, uh, it was abject. One of the worst performances <laughs> I've seen this season from us, and it's been a pretty abject season all round. So, um, yeah, I'd sort of put that out of my mind, but uh, yeah, awful. Um, of course, the the Justin Greenwood derby is is Norwich versus Aston Villa for anyone it who hasn't picked up on that. But uh, yeah, there you go. That's football. So our our other regular feature, or one of our regular features, is uh, what's the most nineties. Now this is the the feature where we take it in turns to ask each other what we think the most nineties of a certain uh, genre or group or category is. So in the past we've done uh what have we done we did fashion accessory and yeah. football team, didn't we yeah that's fashion right accessory was what do we what, what do we agree on with that it uh was, i think i oh, went for oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, go on. and i went for friendship bracelets i think and you went for yeah. wraparound sunglasses yeah. yeah and then football clubs we both agreed it was it was between wimbledon. coventry and wimbledon yeah yeah, yeah. exactly but coventry yeah. ended up going in the pod ledger as the official football league club of the Indeed. pod so what we can take from this feature so far is that normally we decide on two things and then we decide that the second thing is better than the first and that's what goes in the ledger. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly, yeah. Um, <laughs> but this this episode's um, What's the Most 90 is uh, snack foods. So I put this to you in advance, George. Yep. What did you come up with uh, for the Most 90 snack food? Well, what I've gone for is, uh, is the much-missed Cadbury Astro. Mm. Now, I don't know if you remember these at all. Uh, very vaguely. I don't know if I ever ate one or a packet yes. of them, but well, I'm going to search for it just to remind myself of the packaging. But go on. So they were launched in 1997 um, and they came in, a, they came in a, a cardboard box, which is oh, similar yes. in size to like a box of uh, nerds. Oh, yeah. If, if you remember oh, those, yes. but, but they're not as uh, they're, they're much larger than nerds. Um, and they were launched to be a rival, a Cadbury rival to um, sort of Smarties and M and M's, like the the, the small mm. uh, round uh, chocolate, if you like, in a hard shell. Um, 
I remember this being ad- these being advertised relentlessly in the Beano, which is which is what I read at the time uh, yeah, yeah. religiously. I remember there being big full page adverts for um for, for Cadbury's Astros, and it was all obviously space uh, space themed and everything like that. And um, I used to get bought a lot of Cadbury's Astros by by my aforementioned gran and various aunts and uncles, which I enjoyed. Um, apparently, according to the research I did, they're they're still sold in South Africa only. South Africa is the only place in the world you can get them. So uh, I'll put a plea out there now if we have any South African listeners. The stats would suggest not at the moment. Um, <laughs> you know, we've got one in Peru, apparently. Have you seen this? Have we? No, I haven't. You had that. a look at the breakdown? Yeah, no. Peru, Japan. Yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. Well, hello, hello, there, hello you, to yeah. you. Yeah. Please get in touch and let us know. Um, yeah, any South African listeners who can bung us a couple of boxes of Astros in the post, yeah. uh, let, let us know. I'd be happy to cover any any carriage costs. Uh, so I can experience that again. But yeah, they 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 they're light burned uh, brightly, but briefly. Don't remember them hanging around for for more than a few years. Um, but yeah, I would have to go for for the Cadbury Astro. Uh, how about how about you, mate? Have you had any ideas on this? I did. Um, I I sort of I was racking my brain for for very nineties crisps. And, if you uh... mention Hedgehog crisps again, I know that you <laughs> you are right in their pocket. <laughs> right. <laughs> I am a slave to to big crisp, um, <laughs> and especially big hedgehog, uh, hedgehog crisp. <laughs> yeah, but no, I didn't go to didn't go for crisps. I didn't go for chocolate. Quite. I did, I went for sw- for a sweet, uh, and it was the uh, the push pop. And I don't know if you remember uh-huh. push pops, but um, I think they might still exist, but probably very hard to find in this country if they do because they're very American. The adverts are always very American, and um, I just remember the adverts being everywhere for a bit. It felt like for a long time, but it's probably for about a month. And the the slogan or the tagline of their adverts was "Don't push me, push the push pop," um, mm-hmm. and it was yeah, it was just everyone was doing it in the playground. You know, if someone got barged into or something, then then <laughs> the response would be "Don't push me, push the push pop," and it was um, hilarious at the time. And I just think it's the most nice because it's um, the packaging was all very garish, bright colours. It's like excessive plastic, um, and those adverts were just full of sort of that nineties mm-hmm. aggressive sort of um, attitude. You know, like lads and ladettes and yeah you know just a bit of argy bargy i thought that's kind of 90s um and that's what i went for so i don't know if you ever had one but um i thought oh that's a good idea Cause what they were basically was if you don't know listeners which you probably don't it was it was like a plastic a bit like a lipstick or a lip balm tube it's made of plastic and you would sort of twist it or no you push it <laughs> hence the name and the sort <laughs> of just a hard boiled sweet cylinder would sort of push up you'd you know suck it for a bit put the lid back on and then put it away and i thought that's a good idea because you know you can come back to it i like the idea of something you can sort of savor for a while but it didn't work because the the tube that you pushed up your finger would go inside it and after using it once that would just be full of like sweet sugary oh, yeah, sticky yeah. sort of residue mm-hmm. so it was just gross i only ever had one push pop because i was so disappointed <laughs> by the actual ergonomics of it and how it works but um yeah, that that was what came to my mind for the most nineties snack food. So mm-hmm. I can we, well imagine eight year old Alex being disappointed by the ergonomics of a particular snack food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I do love stationery. I think it ties in with that as well because it was like a, a, a pen, a sweet in pen pen form. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, so it looks like we've gone for push pops and Astros, Cadbury's Astros. Yes. So far. I'm happy to tap both of them. I don't think we need to choose between either of them. Or unless cool, we do, maybe cool. that's something we need to make as part of the feature is that we go head to head and <laughs> well, we think <laughs> about it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. If anyone wants to write in or tweet us with their own thoughts for uh, the most 90 snack food, please do, you know, all the channels we're on and uh, we'll, we'll remind you of all that at the end of the episode anyway. Please do. Um, here's something that I've half remembered, which I'm not sure. It might've been a fever dream. I'm mm. not sure, but with the sort of, lollipop uh uh you know a uh, gimmick type thing i'm sure i remember late 90s possibly there was it was i think you bought the like the holder for the lollipop and the idea was that you put you put a lollipop in it mm. and then you would press the button it would rotate the lollipop like in your mouth but <laughs> yeah. if you held the lollipop and if you held it in contact with your teeth yeah you could then hear a song playing inside your head oh my goodness I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure that this this was a thing I'm sure I saw it advertised and it was like a tie-in with some awful boy band that were around for about five minutes 
Oh, wow. But I am absolutely sure that, there, yeah, you put the lollipop in, you press the button, it went round, you put it against your teeth and it played, you, you could hear the song. Yeah. Like, like you were listening to it like through headphones or something. I will have to look into that because, um, yeah, that, that definitely deserves more investigation, I think. Uh, wow. And we're, we're nothing if not, um, you know, Britain's finest invest- investigative uh, 90s. 90s reporters so yeah leave that with us we'll get we'll get back to you after christmas the idea of 911 being ground into your teeth <laughs> directly into your brain sounds like some sort of torture but uh yeah yeah i'd love to hear from from the listeners if they can back that um fanciful sounding product up uh um, here we go here we go go on right this is on from reddit sound oh. bites the lollipop that played music in your head through your mouth Sandbite's lollipop produced by Cap Candy circa 1998, a lollipop that supposedly contained a radio, was developed, blah, blah, blah. The battery-operated device sent vibrations through the lollipop stick, so when you bit down on the lollipop, you could hear music inside your head through bone conduction. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awful. <laughs> it contained no radio, though it easily could have. Uh, there were six different versions and three musical themes, guitar, drums and saxophone. Wow. It sounds... Did you say saxophones? Yeah. <laughs> God, imagine it. Oh, I wonder if it, I'm guessing they're not available anymore. It sounds like a very uh, of its time thing. Well, now you're sending me over to eBay, aren't you? I mean, <laughs> this is like when I tried to get one of my old girlfriends a Teddy Ruck spin for Christmas. <laughs> What's a Teddy Ruck spin? <laughs> it was, it was a toy she used to call about, which was um, it, it was like a teddy bear, but it had a cassette, um, it had a cassette deck in it in its like chest. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. And it had special tapes that came with it. And then if you if you played the tape, it, the the mouth of the teddy bear would move, and it would be like it was like reading you a story or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, Sounds creepy. <laughs> yeah. Very much so. No, that, that's uh, that's eighties though, so we'll, we'll forget about that. Okay, um, as the numerous cheesy sound effects will indicate, this episode of the podcast is a special festive edition, uh, and to celebrate this, we have a guest. Uh, none other than the official brother of the pod, uh, the <laughs> too oft mentioned uh, Adam Greenwood. Adam, hello. How are you? Hello. I'm um, uh, not too bad, thanks. How are you? Uh, well, I'm okay. Yes, I'm okay. I like I, I mentioned earlier that I'm uh, staving off the uh, the Christmas lurgy. Well, COVID actually, but um, apart from that, I'm okay. Jocelyn, I think you're uh, you, <laughs> yeah, you've, you've already staved us off. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm coming out the other side of it, but I'm just, uh, it's given me an extra lift to be in the presence of, uh, of pod royalty tonight. I think possibly the most mentioned person throughout the entire run of the ep- of, of the pod so far. So it's uh, it's great to have you on on such an auspicious occasion, Adam. Oh, thanks. Uh, I was, <laughs> I still haven't got completely through the last episode. I'm halfway through your last episode, the football one. I did enjoy Alex's it seemed like genuine annoyance that he'd he'd mentioned me in that episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I thought I was going to be able to do an ep- whole episode without mentioning you, but it's, it's oh, not possible. It is not possible. We've... <laughs> no, apparently not. Um, okay, so yes, to explain what we're going to do for this episode, each of us have chosen our our favourite '90s Christmas song, Christmas film, and yes. and our favourite. Christmas present that we received in the 90s we're going to go through them one at a time and yeah see how they uh, see how they go down and see if we agree or disagree with each other um I think we also have a wild card I'm not sure if you do Adam but I know me and Stu do but the wild card is the thing actually I I can speak the longest on probably (laughs) that's good that's good okay so we've got a wild card as well okay um Stu, do you want to start with one of your choices? Yeah, I could. St- shall I start us off with the movies? Yeah, seeing as we the mentioned movies. those first in the rundown. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So what I've gone for is uh, now. Yes, your Terminator. Yes, your Eraser. Uh, yes, uh, your twins. But we all know that Arnold Schwarzenegger's finest hour was 1996's Jingle All the Way. Uh, it's 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 my favourite Christmas film. Uh, always gets a spin every year. Although uh, I, I did have to uh, get hold of it on DVD last year because it disappeared from the uh, disappeared from the streaming services for some reason, which which I've been relying on. So uh, so I've had to uh, had to pick it up on DVD. Uh, a healthy seventeen percent rating on Rotten Tomatoes, which I feel is is extremely unfair. 
<laughs> so what percentage? Did you um, say 17 or 70? Oh, 17, one seven. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's so. Uh, that's unbelievable. <laughs> um, appearances uh, apart from uh, apart from Arnold himself, of course, from uh, Phil Hartman, better known as the voice of uh, Troy McClure, Lionel Hutz, La Landley uh, from The Simpsons. Yeah, yeah. It's impossible to watch anything that Phil Hartman is in as Phil Hartman, the actor, without without thinking of those characters because his voice is yeah, obviously yeah. just so uh, so synonymous with them. Um, Martin Mull, who you might remember as uh, Sabrina's head teacher from Sabrina the Teenage Witch. I think that was his, uh, his best known role. Uh, and of course, uh, Jake Lloyd, who plays uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's son, who went on to be Anakin Skywalker in, in The Phantom Menace a few years later. Oh, OK. Um, yeah. 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 So, so, so they're all in there. So it's, it's packed full of um, packed full of star quality. Um, listen, it's not a very good film. The, 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 the plot is, um, uh, you know, the plot's paper thin. Some of the acting's a bit dodgy, but it's great fun. And listen, it's, it's just uh, it's just what you look for in a Christmas film. You know, it's uh, it hasn't got anywhere left to, left to go at the end of its uh, <laughs> at the end of its 90 minutes. Um, but every every second of that is is well used, I feel. And yeah, the race for Turbo Man is, is something that I just like to go back to every year. Um, I have to say Arnie's ca uh, casting as a middle management family man from Minneapolis is a little bit incongruous. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit of suspense and does, disbelief required, isn't there? For that? <laughs> indeed, indeed, yeah. It does make me feel that possibly um, it wasn't written with him in mind. I, I, I don't know. I haven't done too much research. Um, but but yeah, for him to be uh, yeah an Austrian bodybuilder in a uh, in a in a middle class uh, American family at Christmas is um, is very very entertaining. So yeah, highly recommended if you've not seen it for a few years. Uh, uh, get yourself after it. As I say, it's not uh, it's not going to trouble the best uh, best Christmas movie lists, but it's great fun all the same. And uh, yeah, I, I presume you guys have, uh, have seen Jiggle all the way multiple times. <clears throat> I I don't think I've ever seen it. <laughs> I. Oh, I, I feel I feel ashamed to say that uh, to you, but uh, I don't think I've ever seen it. Have you seen it, Adam? I have seen it, but I think I've only seen it maybe once. Actually, it's it's one of those Christmas films. I, I re realize that I've only ever seen. I only saw Home Alone for the first time uh, when I was twenty eight. So there's a lot of like nineties films that that I missed out on at the time, and so yeah, I've only seen Jiggle all the way once. I think. Well, there's something to be said for that, because to, to have all these, you know, seminal 90s things that you can catch up on and have fresh eyes on. Them. I only saw Home Alone for the first time last year when I was 32. Oh, wow. So, okay. so, so I, I've beaten you by, by, You've beaten mine. by quite a few years there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So I think, you know, people do react in a funny way when you say, oh, I haven't seen this or I haven't seen that. But the way I see it is I've just been saving it up, you know, and now yeah. I can now I can enjoy it. So uh, yeah, you can so, only yeah. watch you can only watch these films for the first time once, can't you? I, exactly. I, I saw Home Alone one um, last week. It's one of those films where I thought I had seen it m multiple times, but um, I think I've just seen the second one loads of times because and I've, well, I've definitely seen the first bit where you know they're all leaving the house and Kevin realizes he's been left behind. But then everything after that, I was just like, I don't remember this at all. So I think there's certain films like that that. Uh, so talked about and you catch bits of them so often mm -hmm. that you think you've seen the whole thing or you think you've seen the whole thing lots of times but actually yeah maybe maybe you haven't um and that was the case with home alone for me but um yeah jingle all the way all i can think of is the bit where he dives he dives there's a bit where he like dives in a shop you know like trying to reach something that's my image of the film that's right yeah so so they're looking for um he's trying to get a turbo man doll for uh for jamie and um I, there's something to do with um, it's like a bingo ball system. There's a store that's got a certain amount of, of the dolls, and it's it's bingo balls, and they're all trying to get the the, the right mm. coloured ball or something. Oh, okay. um, yeah, and he he creates a bit of a scene trying to get the right coloured ball, as I as I remember. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Just just one more thing on Home Alone. I personally think uh, Kevin McAllister's better off without his family. I think they're awful. Good point. <laughs> That's a really good point. I, I'm watching it again last week. It, it, it's a child abuse. Yeah, it's no, like yeah. the way Straight he gets up. treated the night before is is appalling. They they lock, basically lock him in the attic because he's been bullied by the rest of the uh, yeah the family. It's awful. Yeah, yeah. There Maybe we go. I saw it in a new light. Um, <laughs> so can I just say, have, have you did you beat both me and Joslyn in having seen it latest? 
in life. No, well, I, I, I saw it twenty at age twenty eight, and you only watched it a couple of days ago. No, I think that's what it sounded like when I said that. But I think, well, I'm not sure. I've definitely seen bits of it many times over the years. But like the bit when he's in the church and the old man who like he's scared of and stuff, all that stuff I couldn't remember at all. Mm-hmm. And the actual bit, the home invasion bit, which I thought was the whole film, is only for like. 10 minutes or 15 minutes of it um and that surprised me as well i guess because the second one there's a lot more of that um so i don't know i don't know when i saw it first but uh yeah maybe maybe half of it i did only see last week uh, in which case i would win that weird competition we we're having <laughs> um okay uh, moving on adam what was the film what was your film your christmas film <clears throat> well i struggled with this because i sort of thought there's loads gonna be loads to pick from and every time i thought of a film I thought that's an easy choice. It turned out to be either from the 80s or into the 2000s. So I had to rule out a few a few that I would have liked to have picked and then a film that which I really wanted to have, which I don't even really think is a Christmas film, but feels Christmassy, was in the 80s. And then I did re-watch a couple of, of 90s Christmas films expecting to be pleasantly reminded of, of how good they were. And then I was I was a bit underwhelmed. So I watched The Santa Claus with um tim allen in mm-hmm. uh, and that was sort of fine it was it was sort of maybe better than i thought it was going to be he wasn't as dislikable as i expected him to be but he was still quite dislikable and then i read afterwards that the the film was originally pitched to bill murray and it would have been a far far better film if it had been bill murray because the premise is quite quite good i don't know if you've seen it the one where it's quite a dark premise really when you think about it so if Tim Allen kills Father Christmas, <laughs> so indi- it would have like been that. it would have been manslaughter rather than murder. But he's on the <laughs> he, he's on the he's on the roof. Well, let's let a jury out. decide that. I think. And yeah, he, well, that's Jeff. Well, that's Jeff. Well, that's Jeff. <laughs> he um yeah, he sort of surprises him and and he slips, falls off the roof, and falls to his death. And uh, then Tim Allen has to sort of take on the role. And he's sort of resistant and reluctant to it at first, but then it's sort of won over quite quickly when, when the magic of Christmas happens and the, the reindeers fly and everything. Um, and then by the end of the year, he has properly evolved into Father Christmas because the, the, the folklore is if you kill Santa, you have to become Santa, which is probably quite a good premise for a, a horror film as much as it is as a, as a Christmas film. Um, Agreed. Yeah. But it would have been it would have been a far far better film if it had, had Bill Murray, who apparently turned it down because he said it wasn't really his his type of humor. But it's exactly his based on Scrooge. It's exactly his yeah mm-hmm, in well, his. So was Scrooge before this then or not? Because you Scrooge is an eighties. I assume okay. it's eighties. Otherwise, that would have been a contender for. Best yeah, that seems. I'm pretty sure it seems like it's eighties. <clears> Let me just look that up because otherwise we've all. I would say it's of mid mid eighties. Based on what I remember of the the outfits and the fashion, and it would be a bit odd if um, Bill Murray did do two Christmas films. Um, it's nineteen eighty-eight. Maybe that's it. Yeah, eighty-eight. So yeah, we couldn't have it. Okay, so what did did you go for then? <clears throat> well, I think I mean I've got the same as as you, which was Die Hard Two or Die Harder, as I think it was released as at the time, which I think <laughs> is a, a far funnier and more nineties name for a sequel. <laughs> Than just mm-hmm. Die Hard too, um, and I, I'm sure you'll probably talk about it more tonight. Than I will talk about it, but I think because it's set at Christmas and there's more snow in it, and there's a, a, a chase on skidoos, which I think is yeah. probably the most Christmassy. It's ex- exactly where action and Christmas meet in the Venn yeah. diagram is like a, a skidoo, like a car chase. <laughs> but yeah, that that would probably I would say that it's probably a toss up between that and the Muppets Christmas Carol, which I feel is probably it, it's probably is the most Christmassy '90s film. But again, I didn't watch it until quite late in adulthood, so I don't have the nostalgia for it that other people do. I sort of I do think it's a great film, but I don't love it in the way that other people do. I would feel like a fraud saying that that's my favourite Christmas film. Mm. That's Michael Caine's greatest work. I mean, yeah, let's let's not let's not put any punches here. It's, um... <laughs> Between that and uh, Jaws Four: The Revenge, uh, <laughs> which he, he famously did just so he could uh, go and film in the Caribbean. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, I I get what you mean about like 
feeling like you should say things because they're such classics, but maybe not actually having any connection to them, personal connection to them. But yeah, yeah I have. Yeah, so go on. I was going to say, in, in the same way that Citizen Kane was sort of commonly believed to be the best. Actually, no, that's a terrible analogy. Cut that out. <laughs> I was going to make a, right. Citizen, a Citizen Kane and then Paddington analogy, but I don't really know how that marries up with uh, Muppets <laughs> Christmas Carol and Die Hard. <laughs> Are you saying Paddington is better than Citizen Kane? Is that what you were going to say? It, well, I haven't seen Citizen Kane, so I can't say personally. But officially, it was, wasn't it? For a, for a short while, it 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 was officially the best film because it had the least negative reviews. It had a hundred percent perfect, no negative uh, reviews. Paddington, and there was one negative review of uh, Citizen Kane. So for for a short while, Paddington Two or Paddington, sorry, was or maybe it was Paddington Two. It was one of the two. But having seen both Paddingtons, I would find it hard to believe that Citizen Kane is better. I can't believe that they're the only two films that have got, or Paddington's the only film that has a completely positive um, review score. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe it is. It is good. I'm not going to deny that. We'll have to check that for Jingle All The Way too, which I believe is, um, <laughs> which I believe is up there. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I have chosen Die Hard 2, Die Harder. Um, which was released uh, in 1990, so it just about makes a cut. Weirdly, it was, it was released in summer of 1990, which um, I think is a bit odd for what is clearly a Christmas film. I, I think people will argue that it's not a Christmas film in the same way they do with Die Hard 1. It's a classic Christmas debate, um, but it is a Christmas I've never film. understood that, uh, that, that sort of thing. I mean, although I did hear, um, I can't remember where, where I was well, where I heard this, but there's a distinction between films that are set at Christmas and films which revolve around things that happen at Christmas, if you see what I mean. And that's supposed yeah. to be what decides if it's a Christmas movie or not. So by that distinction, the Die Hards wouldn't be a Christmas movie, or would they be? Because it's a Christmas party at the Nakatomi Plaza, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I I'm... Get- yeah, I mean, compared to someone like thinking about it, but <laughs> I mean, the Santa Claus <laughs> is about Father Christmas, so yeah, I get that that's revolves around it. So you can definitely say it's a Christmas film, but it can't be that black and white because yeah, yeah, yeah. There'd, yeah, there'd be loads of things that weren't that clearly are. Um, yeah, I sorry, think, I, I think there'll be a real the the real defining thing if you had to separate a film between a film that's set at Christmas and a film that revolves around Christmas is quality. I think there's very few films about Christmas which are any actually any good and then the films w- with a couple of exceptions but I think the films which happen to be set at Christmas are the films which are generally better like like mm-hmm. Die Hard and Die Hard 2 and It's a Wonderful Life I mean if It's a Wonderful Life wouldn't be a Christmas film if you're going to go by that that um, argument because it's set around Christmas but it's nothing to do with Christmas that's very um, true that is very true and there's no way you can't include that um so yeah Die Hard 2 um I think it's the overlooked Die Hard of the trilogy as well. I'm sort of, I'm referring to it as a trilogy. Obviously, there's later ones that we don't really want to talk about because um, no, they no. sully the the trilogy. But um, if they're not first... on the play, if they're, if they're not not on the PlayStation One, <laughs> no, not on the <laughs> compilation video game Die compilation. No, they don't count. That's ca- that's the canon. Yeah, there we are. That's the yeah, rule. yeah. Happy with that. But, but of those original three, I think the second one is the slightly overlooked one. I think the first one is often talked about as the, the greatest action film of all time. The third one, especially amongst um, uh, millennials like us, is quite big because I think it had, you know, it had Samuel L. Jackson and um, Jeremy Irons and it was kind of a big blockbuster, whereas the second one just sort of falls in between. But I think it's really good. Um, and the, the, the first one obviously has uh, Alan Rickman, the great Alan Rickman, but I see you, Alan Rickman, and I raise you, Dennis Franz, the the greatest character actor of all time, maybe the I genuinely think maybe the best ever TV character, which is Andy Sipowitz from NYPD Blue, played by Dennis Franz, um, and he he's in Die Hard too. He plays the sort of irritating cop that gets in the way and is you know trying to um, get in the way of John McClane and um, mm-hmm. basically go by the book, bit of a Jobsworth cop. Um, and anything that's got Dennis Franz in, he's not been in that many films as far as I know, not any big ones anyway. And if he's in it, then, you know, I'm sold, whatever the film is. Uh, so that's that's the main reason I've chosen it. But um, also because I think it's a bit overlooked, yeah, like I said. And it's maybe the best of the Die Hard trilogy PlayStation game of the three. 
and it's definitely the most Christmassy computer game I can think of. If if you're gonna you know to build up to Christmas, you want to play a computer game. Is there anything more Christmassy than that? Than uh, the second part of the Die Hard trilogy computer game? Not that I can think of. I only had the Die Hard trilogy on Sega Saturn, so I never uh, had the PlayStation experience. But okay. um, yeah, no, I, I know where I know I know the game well. I know the game well. Okay, great. Well, shall we move on to songs? Stu, do you want to give us your your nineties song? Certainly, certainly. By the way, um, greatest character actor of all time, I think Sir Jimmy Nell might have something to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> so my uh, choice for a Christmas song, again, it, it goes to the debate of is it a Christmas song or not. It was Christmas number one in 1994, and it's Stay Another Day by E17. Uh, Alex, Adam, do you think Stay Another Day is a Christmas song? Yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. You do. Okay. There's no okay. there's no mention of Christmas in the lyrics as far as I'm aware, but I'm sure I don't know if this is the Mandela effect, but I'm sure there's like sleigh bells in it. Yeah. That's, that's right. Cool. Yeah. In my research, I've uncovered the fact that yeah, it wasn't a Christmas song at all, but then the sleigh bells and everything were added in uh, in into the the mix towards the end of the song to appeal to the, the Christmas market. Oh, that's um, quite cynical. So, yes, yeah. It was, and I won't dwell on this, uh, dwell on this too long, too much, because it's obviously a very, uh, a very sad thing. But it was inspired by the suicide of Tony Mortimer's brother. Yeah, the the main songwriter in E17, his brother Oliver, um, who, who who took his own life. Yeah, it's in the in the video, in in the famous black and white video where they've got the Parkers on. You can see that there's a tear rolling down his face as he um, as he uh, records the video. It was a song that I associate a lot with 90s Christmas. Um, I actually have it on picture disc vinyl, which is uh, which is something as well. That's, uh, that's, wow. that's pretty cool to have in the collection. And um, there's a great alternative video, which you don't see a lot, played on the music channels or anything around this time of year, where they're actually, they're not in the, the stupid parkers and everything. They're in the studio recording a song and they're all there with the, um, it's quite funny actually, they're all there with the like the big timpani drums and the glockenspiels to make it look like they, they recorded all the, all the percussion themselves. <laughs> But yeah, it actually held off um, All I Want for Christmas Is You uh, oh, in, really? in 94. Yeah, and that was number two in 94. I don't think Mariah Carey's song actually got to number one until a couple of years ago. I think it, it did become Christmas yeah. number one in the end, like last it. year or the year before. I know it's been it's been that lab baby guy for, for quite a few years, hasn't it? But um, yeah, anyway, so, um, so yeah, when I think of 90s uh, Christmas songs, even though we associate it with Christmas, even though it's not really a Christmas song. I always think Stay Another Day. Yeah. So uh, any any particular thoughts or, or memories on this one? I would quite like to pull you back a little bit. Stupid Parkers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sorry about that. Sorry, I, I, I was in the flow. I, I, I'll retract that. I'll retract that. I wouldn't mind a Parker like that. I'm a those stupid. are incredible, yeah. incredible outfits and probably quite practical for the condition. <laughs> yeah. At the time, with all that polystyrene snow blowing around. Yeah, absolutely. No, 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 I'm sorry. As I say, I was in the flow and I retract that statement fully. It was nothing if not fastidious on this podcast. I definitely think of E17 as being a, your one of your bands, Adam. Like the one of the first bands that you were, I would identify as a band you liked, you know, like a band you were into, or if you can call them a band. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I I was a huge fan. I bought, I bought three albums and... Well, yeah, was a was a huge, huge fan. Well, three albums. I guess that was an album a year. I can't imagine you being into them for for three years or more. But I guess I probably bought the middle album, Steam. Yeah. And loved that so much that I went to their back catalogue mm. <laughs> and bought the one before, which I've called Walthamstow. I think oh, it was called oh, Walthamstow, yeah. mm-hmm. which had All Right on, which was like their, I guess, their first big song and West End, their cover of West End Girls, and then my love for them sort of spilled over into the next album, which I didn't like as much. And then I think after that, mm-hmm. my, my music tastes changed. <laughs> I think I maybe got rid of the CDs not that long ago. And I, I do regret it occasionally. I sort of think, oh, it might be nice to stick on. <laughs> See, I, I was, <laughs> yeah. a, te- I, I was like, a take that guy. And uh, obviously E17 was sort of the, the bad boy equivalent of E17, uh, uh, take that, weren't they? So, so I was on the other side of the track. I, uh, you know, I liked my boy band's uh, clean cut, and uh, you know, you could take them home to meet your mum and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
Um, Take that, of course, never had a Christmas number one. They're, they came closest in 93 when they got to number two with Babe. They were held off the top by. It was a novelty track. Uh, it's too early for Mr. Blobby, isn't it? It was Mr. Blobby, correct. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, I've got I'm, a feeling I've mentioned that on this pod before, so I apologise if... I apologise if I'm going over old ground, but it's just such a great pop fact. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm glad that Gary Barlow was thwarted by Mr. Blobby. I don't particularly <laughs> like Mr. Blobby, but in that particular competition, I'm glad that he, um, he got one over on um, on Take That. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to say about the E17? Shall we move on? No, I've been I've been I don't wish to say anything else that might offend offend Adam. <laughs> I've, I've I've done I've done enough with the stupid Parker, so we better move on quickly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Adam. What is your choice? Uh, well, it was mentioned earlier, and it, it was Mariah Carey's uh, "All I Want for Christmas." I think, I think that is clearly, if not the best, then definitely one of the best Christmas songs of all time, uh, in terms of how catchy it is, how recognisable the video is, and iconic the video is, and it's just like a really good, catchy Christmassy song, like a good Christmassy sentiment about like rejecting consumerism and what the true meaning of Christmas is, which is obviously not religious. It's about it's like family and being with loved ones and things i think that's it's sort of yeah like a perfect christmas song but i feel like that's a bit of an obvious choice so another song i wanted to mention briefly is like a, a notable other song is christmas time by uh, the smashing pumpkins which i think is a very different style of christmas song but still like really really great i hadn't heard that until you mentioned it and i listened to it earlier today and yeah i did like it it was it's just sort of a kind of straight down the middle christmas song isn't it it's not trying to be anything else still suffers slightly from having billy corgan as the singer <laughs> uh, yet again he ruins another smashing pumpkin song by having his voice how many uh, more will suffer? Yeah, exactly but yeah i liked it i thought it was it was good i, I will listen to it again actually because i'd never heard of it before unlike unlike the mariah carey song which i, I agree is feels like it should be the biggest christmas song of the 90s I, I didn't realize it wasn't number one that's that's that was news to me but i guess maybe in america it was it probably was but um i would it, imagine so yeah i mean she it, was um it, she hadn't really i think it was if not her i think it kind of been her first single but she was like a relative newcomer so she probably didn't have like the fan base that who beat it to number one e17 was that that year yeah that's right yeah 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 so they they were obviously huge at the time so yeah it, it seems like yeah mariah carey that mariah carey song is like something the maybe the only 90s christmas song one of the only 90s christmas songs that really tops so many sort of playlists it's always on a christmas play, a playlist most of the other ones you get you know 70s and 80s but um yeah that one really really persists i did uh my friend nicola the other day said that she didn't like it which um struck me dumb because i just didn't realize anyone didn't like it but um yeah there are some naysayers out there but it's yeah it feels like the biggest one um, that's got to be pure contrarianism surely to say that you don't that you don't like it that's just a, that's just a, trying to get attention surely i don't know nicola were you just trying to get attention were you trying to get my goat i can imagine uh i can imagine you actually believing it but uh yeah get, get in contact and uh explain yourself so my choice if if i can move on to mine oh actually if you'll just allow me a second to talk about a non 90s song uh, much like you were debating whether the E17 song is a Christmas song, I think the best Christmas song of all time is uh, The Power of Love by Frankie Goes to Hollywood, which many people say isn't a Christmas song because it's got no connection to Christmas. But the music video is does depict the, the three kings visiting yes. Jesus on, um, on, his, on his birthday. So I think it's a Christmas song and it's the best one. But it's not a 90s, so I couldn't include it here, obviously. The choice I've gone for is Blink 182's Won't Be Home for Christmas, which was recorded and released as a radio promo in 1997, uh, which I think is maybe Blink's golden pop punk era. It was sort of, it's quite early for them. It's in between Dude Ranch and Enro of the State coming out. It's got their old drummer. It's when they're still kind of a bit more skate punk. And I didn't really know it until a f- like a few years ago, but I just, yeah, the last few years I've really got into it and it's just. It's classic. It is Blink at their best, and it also happens to be a great Christmas song. The the lyrics are sort of they're, they're anti Christmas spirit. They're, they're about um, uh, Mark being visited by some carol singers who annoy him so much that he chases him with a baseball bat and ends up in in jail. Um, and so it's yeah, it's kind of anti Christmas spirit, but it's it's got sleigh bells in the background, so it's definitely Christmassy as well as the the, the, the lyrics. I just think it's it's a glorious pop punk 
song. I think Tom Tom DeLonge's riffs are just amongst his, his best Blink riffs. It's just irresistible, I think. And I do occasionally listen to it outside of the Christmas season because I think it's it's so good. But um, that's the sign of a good Christmas song. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, quite right. And I just yeah, I just like that it's um it's a bit a bit against. It's not like pop punk is not generally connected to to the Christmas period or you don't think of that genre much when it comes to Christmas Christmas music. But uh, this is just a great a great song I think. And if you haven't heard it, I think you should should check it out. Get it on your playlist. I, I acknowledge that neither of you may have much to say about this. Although I do think <laughs> I do think Blink One Two is another Adam band, like in the lineage of of Adam bands. This is one of the bigger ones, definitely. Did you swap E Seventeen for Blink One Eight Two? Was that was there a? There might have, there must have been another band in between, but oh, there might. I don't know how much of a a gap there would have been between them. I think there would have been potentially some overlap. It went E Seventeen, <laughs> Lightning Seeds, Blur. Blink 182 for you, I think. If if my ears, like the music that was coming through your bedroom door, was anything. It could have like been, that. yeah. That that sort of sounds familiar. I'd, I, there must have been a, like a crossover period between a couple of those. This sort of seemed like oh, yeah. bed fellows, E17 and the Lightning Seeds. <laughs> Very early 90s, though, aren't they? Early mid 90s. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't I don't imagine you just like took a E17 CD out of your CD player, never listened to it again, and just replaced it with a Lightning Seeds. Snapped uh, it. I'm sure there was. Yeah, there would have been some. <laughs> Uh, well, CDs were sort of expensive at the time, so you would, you would, I would listen to one, and then that that one would come out, and it would just be the next, the next one potentially. Yeah, it's like that scene in uh, "It's a Wonderful Life" where she she's in a bad mood and she takes the record off the uh, record player and just smashes it on the record player. That's what you were like with your CD. That's it, <laughs> done, done the steam. Um, it's not all right anymore. <laughs> Shall we move on to Christmas presents? Stu, do you want to say what your the the best ever Christmas present you got? Not best ever, doesn't make sense. The best Christmas present you got in the nineties? Certainly. Well, it is the best uh, best ever Christmas present I've got. Nothing has ever topped this, okay. really. Good. Let me tell you about the Christmas ninety five. I was uh, eagerly awaiting uh, Take That Live at Earl's Court to be broadcast on on ITV from earlier in the summer. They 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 had the rights to broadcast that. I take the gig I uh, played it for months after and then uh, one day put it in and found that my dad had taped an episode of Celebrity Ready Steady Cook over it <laughs> but that is another story for oh, another of all time the things. of all the things <laughs> of you all didn't the things. this before he came on did you <laughs> I was an action man kid right so and so and I still got in fact I should have brought it in the room so I, so I could show you guys I've still got my first action man it's on it's on top of the um, the bookcase in the, in our bedroom uh, just uh, just hanging out there in its uh, pride of place and for Christmas 95 I got an a jeep for my action man which I presume my parents got out of the Argos catalog but it was when I when I got it on the day I mean my it came as a sort of flat pack if that makes sense you had to put it together and my mum says to this day that it's it's one of the the most fun things she, she she sort of ever did in my early in my early life was putting together this jeep for me. She enjoyed the process of uh, of putting it together so much. It was it was brilliant. I played with it for years and years with my with my various action men as I added different action men and different enemies. I never had a Doctor X, but I had a Doctor Gangrene. My friend Matt Coe had a Doctor X, so we used to we used to pool our resources. And I, I tried to do some research on this to, to, to find out when it was made and, and, you know, how many were sold and all this sort of thing. But this was all part of the so originally Action Man 60s and 70s was made by a company called Palatoy. And then the rights went over to Hasbro. There aren't many websites that are dedicated to Action Man stuff that's been made by Hasbro. It's all the classic Palatoy stuff. It's not much really amongst collectors. There's not much um, not much love for the Hasbro stuff. But yeah, I, I had a I had an Action Man sports car after that, which was loosely based on like the the Dodge Viper that came out in the mid nineties. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, that wasn't as good. It didn't it didn't work as well. But yeah, the the, the Jeep it had a, I remember it had a big gun mounted on the back, and there was room for two dolls to to go in, and the doors opened, and the bonnet opened, and all this sort of thing. It was just you know for a I must have been six or seven at the time uh, at Christmas to get that was um I don't think I've ever had a thrill like that at Christmas since you know it's that thing like you were saying like you were saying Al um you can't 
you can only see these things for the first time once with regards to the films. I think you only get that sort of thing once as well um, with, with regards to Christmas presents. And um, I think it got given away to one of my cousins when I when I sort of outgrew it a bit. I'd like to think it's still around somewhere. I think he's probably too old for it now as well. So I'd like to think that it went on somewhere else and went to a, a charity shop or something for, for somebody else to enjoy. But um, I had many, many years enjoyment out of my action man jeep with me and my friends and um yeah i definitely put that as my my greatest christmas present not not just of the 90s but but to date if you know if somebody gives me a check for 10 million pounds in a few days time then maybe i'll have to maybe i'll have to reconsider but yeah it's, it's the action man jeep for me very nice i like that i never had an action man i don't think we did i think we did have a no maybe we did we maybe had an old one we definitely had an action man jeep but like uh mm just an old one that we must have got from a car boot or something so yeah my main memory of that is we had a stop motion camcorder which we used the jeep we had like did a video of it driving around our lawn but yeah. i don't think yeah we didn't really have we action man wasn't really like a big thing in our childhood that from what i remember apart from that jeep no no i think it, I, I always sort of think of action man as being a bit older than the 90s but i guess it's sort of it's always been there in the background hasn't he he it um <laughs> so yeah i guess it's that's you know how you managed to get one it is it, never gone away just maybe it's not not the the action man heyday that that we were in in the 70s and 80s maybe but um mm-hmm. yeah well, it, it, i think it went through a big relaunch in i think it was about 93 with hasbro which is obviously peak time for me because i was uh you know four or five so so in the in the years coming on i know that my my big friends at primary school joe barter friend of the pod and uh, Matt Co, you know, we were all we were all big action man guys, and we used to obviously go around each other's houses and make up stories and and uh, you know do little things like that. And it's uh, you know it's a, a period that I that I look back upon very fondly. I know it's not a period of action man that, that the collectors will will like to look back upon, but for me it's um for me it's right up there. Yeah. I, I have a question: Is is action man? Does does he have a name? Is it the same man, or is it action man a collection of? soldiers i think it's the same guy if, if you're getting an action man it's it's supposed to be the same guy yeah although i'm not sure he actually has a name as such it's, it's just action oh, man, right you know? okay um, the only different ones really were the um i mean this my you know i've not looked at an action man range for, for 20 years but the only different ones were were like the enemy dolls you could get as i recall but you could get obviously arctic action man and you know medical action man and all this sort of stuff so um <clears throat> it was you could get the same doll in different guises much like barbie i suppose you know was yeah. um arctic action man wearing a stupid parker <laughs> <laughs> boy do you know i did have a parker for my action man i'm sure i did i'd like to apologize i'd like to apologize again for that remark <laughs> i think i'll tell you what it is it's the old bronchial balsam. That's what it is. It's got me. Um, it's got me razzed up about Parkers. I'm. I'm out to take myself off air and let you guys finish. <laughs> You're podcasting under the influence. <laughs> um, I've been warned about this before. This is terrible. Speaking of being under the influence, as I mentioned to Alex, I was going to attempt to and, and did. I have made a sort of a Christmassy '90s drink, which is mold hooch. I'm drinking mold hooch. Uh, <laughs> That's brilliant. Which is. Not as I sort of thought, oh, I'll make this, it'll be disgusting, and at least that will get like a bit of a laugh, but it's actually quite tasty. Yeah. What's in it? Is it just hot hooch? Or is there... <laughs> well, I sort of ran out, I ran out of time, so I didn't have a, a chance to sort of mull it for any real long length of time. So it is heated, and I dropped a, a bit of a, a bit of uh, cinnamon bark into it, so... and a, a big chunk of nutmeg. <laughs> well, that's again, the recipe posted up yeah. on the socials, definitely. Adam, what is your what's your nineties Christmas present? The definitive and probably like most nineties to me it feels like the most nineties Christmas present you can get. It was in nineteen ninety, I believe, and it was one of the Hero Turtles action figures. And the year that they were at their most scarce and most popular managed and you also got one of the got the the, the Raphael figure and I got yeah, the Michelangelo Raphael. figure. Yeah. Um so that was that was the big present that year and it's the the one that's sort of that when you asked for a dis, like a definitive Christmas present from the 90s, that was the thing that I first thought of, and I think that's like for, for good reason probably. It's uh, it was our jingle all the way. Sort of I was reality, going to wasn't say, it? Well, yeah, our jingle all the way. Yeah, I, I remember our mum saying that she happened to be in I can't remember if it was Woolworths or WH Smiths when 
a fresh sort of delivery had come in and she had to grab two and she didn't know she sort of had to make a, a guess on which two were our favorites and, and the way that she remembered which were the, the right two was I'd previously drawn a sort of a like a cartoon like comic strip thing with Alex and I and two of like our school friends as versions of the Ninja Turtles so we I was Adam Angelo and Alex was Alex L so that was what my mum <laughs> yeah, re- remembered and that's how she knew which which ones to pick up but I, I imagine that there was a like an Arnie-esque dive towards the <laughs> yeah. towards the shelves when they were sort of brought out was there absolute. a bingo ball you know draw for there it could have been yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. absolute carnage at Emery yeah. Gate in Chippenham mum's going full berserker trying to get these, <laughs> these dolls yeah the other two <laughs> from that group were was Benatello and Jack and Ardo. Jack and Ardo, yeah, yeah. yeah. God, I've forgotten about them. Yeah, um, I only just remembered that sort of earlier today as well. Yeah, I, I actually uncovered a photo of us holding, or maybe it was just me holding holding my Raphael on on that Christmas. I need to I'll post it on the Twitter for for some real nostalgia. Yeah, I've still got mine somewhere. They're definitely like it was out on display for quite a long period, and then got, so I've got put away when I felt the need to sort of make my room a little bit less of a shrine to to toys when there was yeah. a there's a point where i was potentially going to have sort of girls come around i didn't want to like immediately freak them out too much by <laughs> having too many things well, too many bits of memorabilia <laughs> up i'm not worrying about that because here's mine oh there he is with the That's original amazing. the original psi weapons which i've actually had to glue up Fantastic. recently I, I live with a six-year-old half the time and he played with it for a bit and then when the size got broken so i've had to yeah, put, put Raphael in a, in a safe place. And, yeah. Um, My mum went through a similar thing with um, Teletubby dolls in about 1998, but I was far too old to be interested in the Teletubbies, so we won't. We'll gloss over that. Um, <laughs> Did you oh. just want the the must? You knew it was the must have toy, so you <laughs> you you just decided you must have it. Well, I ended up. I, I got a Poe, as I, as I recall, which was um which was my which was my favourite anyway, and I've been. Uh, I don't know if he I don't know if he listens, he might do, but um I've been Facebook friends with Dave Thompson, who was the original Tinky Winky for, for many oh. years now because um I once booked him to to play at um to play at Corsham uh football club when I was uh, when I was doing bits and pieces back there and we became Facebook friends after that. So uh you hi Dave him... if you're listening, we'd love to have you on. Did you book him to, to play... this is a stupid <laughs> question I realise. Not to play football, but yeah, I'm assuming yeah, no, he's, sort of... a, he's a defensive midfielder. Yeah, no, no, he's um, <laughs> he's he's a stand-up in his uh, in his in his regular. Oh, right, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, in his regular career. Yeah, and he uh, he came down and, and did did something for us uh, a few years ago. So yeah, Dave's a good guy. That is everything I think I want to say about it. Other than I did a little bit of research because I wanted to check that it didn't fall outside of the nineties because I I had a sort of sneaking suspicion it might have been eighty nine, which I think was maybe around the time the cartoon came out. Uh, but it was 1990, and the reason I know this is because there was a a BBC News archive video of of how that was the scarce toy that year, and they sort of had a rundown of the most the best selling toys of that Christmas, and the reason that that had been bumped sort of down to fifth or something was that there just wasn't enough. The, the supply was so low that people couldn't get couldn't get them quick enough to buy them, but otherwise it would have been apparently like the biggest selling toy that year. There's a good um yeah good good archive bbc clip of people going so fox pops of people in the yeah, woolworths and things trying to remember the names of the different characters and saying how long they've been queuing outside to get these and all that kind of stuff it's very yeah nice yeah. little time capsule i've been here for four days waiting for a benatello to come up <laughs> <laughs> uh, my my present is also the same year as you Stu. it was 1995 mm-hmm. and it took me a while to think of this, um, and then I I actually happened to be back visiting my parents uh, earlier this month, and I I, I spotted this because um, we still have it, and it's Autosports end of season review magazine for the Formula One season of of 1995. Ah, oh, fantastic! And I, this was in my stocking uh, in in on December 25th 1995, and it's basically the object that really it sort of symbolises my the birth of my infatuation with formula one that, that began that year and ended sort of in the early 2000s it was yeah it was just uh, something had happened that, that led me to gradually get into formula one over that season i don't remember i think it was just on tv i think this was maybe the last year that it was on bbc so it would have been on terrestrial mm-hmm. and i must have caught a bit 
I thought, oh, this, there's something about this, and you know, I just got more. But you're at that sort of age then. I would have been ten, but at that sort of age where you will not just get into something, but you'll be sort of, you'll fall in love with something. You'll become just uh, in, obsessed with something. So halfway through the season, I was, you know, seeing it for the first time. By the end of the season, I was, you know, drawing pictures. There were posters on my walls, and I was just obsessed. And this magazine was sort of just at the right time. And yeah, I just, I, I read it cover to cover or at least looked at the pictures cover to cover over and over again just drinking it all in and sort of trying to learn all the drivers names and you know it'd have a page where it'd sort of have all the, the drivers helmets and some mm-hmm. stats and stuff and yeah I, I looked through it again a year or two ago and yeah just brought it all back and yeah and it's it's my the most nostalgic period of Formula One for me is 95 that season and it's all because of that magazine and that first season you know it's a bit mm. like it's, it's a bit like with Norwich and football kits. My favourite era of football kits is ninety three, ninety four, because that's when I first got into it. And I'm sure that's the same with lots of people. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that that is my present. It's it's the sort of genesis of of that passion, that part of my life, period of my life, the the F1 years as as they refer to them. What have they filled the tacky Inui page with? There must be some advertising on there. <laughs> to, yeah, to bulk it out a bit. Yeah, know? yeah. Tacky Inui just yeah, bought out an advert for himself just to yeah. secure funding for the next season. Friend of the uh, pod. Was he, is he the official F1 driver for the pod? I, let me just check the ledger. I don't think we if have. If he isn't, one. he should be. Yeah, I, I'm putting it in now. All right. Um, does anyone have a a wild card for the uh, for Christmas in the nineties? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, first of all, isn't it wonderful to see Jos Verstappen coming back and winning the, the world title at the age of 49 at the weekend? Yeah. That's that a brilliant was... return for a, for a 90s driver. Uh, yeah, absolutely I get fantastic. fantastic about that. Yeah, absolutely. So for my wild card, I mean, it, it, this was run very close. My wild card was run very close by World's Strongest Man. Now, I have got no interest, as you, uh, you know, as you chaps can see from sitting me sitting here tonight look terrible sound terrible i have no interest in in strength training i have no interest in in anything like that but put it on tv for an hour with people pulling planes with their teeth or whatever right and, and, I'm, and i'm in yeah and this started in about 1996 or 7 when, and it used to be on it still is on every christmas it's on channel 5 now but it used to be on it used to be on bbc one with john in the dale and in the summer you would get uk strongest man um, which yeah. was invariably held at Butlins in Skegness and was invariably won by a huge doorman from Northern Ireland called Glen Ross. I don't know if you're familiar with Glen Ross or remember Glen Ross, but um, I thought that was a place. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <coughs> it's a great movie as well, Glen, Glen Gary, Glen Ross. Gary Ross. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's him and his friend, Glen Gary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, Glen Ross was, let me look this up so, so I've. I've got it right here. Um, so at one point he weighed uh, 474 pounds or 215 kilograms, um, which made him one of the heaviest strong men on the circuit. He won UK Strongest Man five times uh, between 2004 and 2010. And his his catchphrase was uh, he used to bellow, who's the daddy whenever he uh, whenever he won an event and everything like that. But um, yeah, I used to love, uh, and I still do. I still do on on channel Channel Five now. It's a big part of my my Christmas TV, uh, Christmas TV offering. But what what has been beaten to into a narrow second place? What has been beaten by is the Only Fools and Horses uh, 1996 Christmas trilogy. Now at the time, I would have just had my my eighth birthday, um, and I was aware of Only Fools and Horses, but I wasn't really aware of of how big a deal it was and how big a deal these programs were because at the time obviously they were billed as the final the final episodes i clearly remember they they were broadcast over over three consecutive nights i think that christmas in 96 and i clearly remember the the famous final scene at the end where where the three of them walk into the sunset um at the end i I clearly remember watching that at at my nan's house and the reason i've chosen this really is is not so much for the fact that they're they're great Only Fools and Horses episodes, which they are. And I don't know if you're of the same opinion, but they never should have brought it back in the early 2000s. Um, those, those three episodes are, are, well, they're not the best, let's put it that way. Um, and I think they, they had a perfect ending the way it was. But but the reason that I wanted to choose this is because it takes me back to a moment in time where, I mean, I'll, I'll talk to you about a Jocelyn family Christmas. So 
the, the hub of operations was always my nan's house and we lived and my parents still do live down the road from the house where my my nan and granddad used to live and that that was the hub my my mum is one of five um so we would have uh, all the aunts and uncles and the cousins and, and and everything would 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 descend on my nan's for designated days over christmas and we were all there when these were when these were broadcast and it just got me thinking really that you know when when you're eight and, and nine and ten you really look forward to those the, to those evenings when the whole family's there and your cousins the same age are there and you're playing with your presents and everything like this and it's just it's so much fun and it's the greatest and then you get a little bit older 14 15 and it's not where you want to be you know you want to be with your friends and you want to do that i remember one christmas they were all down there at my nan's house and i had the house to myself and i had my friends over instead and all this sort of i was that sort of age and i realized if you, when i was making the notes for this that there would have been a time when all of my family were together at my nan's for like the last time because obviously as we've get older we've we've lost a few people as families do and and uh, and things like that and there would have been a point when you didn't realize it but but that was the last time it happened um and that fools and horses episode from all those fools and horses episodes from 96 just makes me well it makes me miss it really and it makes me uh, it makes me quite emotional really to to think about uh, you know the the people and and uh, and and the fun that we had and the great times uh, so so yeah it's um it's only fours and horses but but really it's the the old style Joslyn family christmas that's my wild card i suppose mm. yeah oh that's really nice yeah yeah i can i can tell how much it means to you and that's uh yeah that's i don't think anything's going to beat that for a choice in the whole episode but, um... <laughs> maybe i shouldn't have gone first <laughs> <laughs> no no that's uh that's good we can we can um We'll carry on and, and yeah, try. Yeah, no, please do, please do. Sorry. Try and follow up, but uh, yeah, that's that's. I mean, that's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, I chop kind that of, out and put that at the end of the at the end of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe we should <laughs> close maybe out should. on that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I remember the. I mean, I'm going to embarrass myself here because I'm not a, <clears throat> I'm not a a massive um, expert by any means on on only fours and horses. But is that is that the one where they find the watch or is that one when they came that's back right yes no it is that yeah, one. yeah 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 so 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 the 96 ones are the ones where they find the watch they sell it at auction and then yeah. they realize that money doesn't make them that happy yeah, yeah. Uh, and then when they come back in and this is this is how much dates it so in the first episode when they come back they lose the money as a result of a dot-com crash uh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. um then in the second one, I think they bring back somebody stows away in, in like they've, they've gone over to France on a booze cruise and somebody stows away in the back of their van mm. and they bring them back over accidentally and all this sort of thing. And it's um, yeah, it's funny. The, the, the ones from the early 2000s are far more dated than the um, than, the, than the ones that ended it in, in 96. But uh, they, they are the diehard 4.0 of of quite right. Awesome quite right. right. Absolutely. Adam, what about your wild card? Um, my wild card is the first Christmas episode of Due South, uh, uh, which I know uh-huh. you've sort of mentioned before on the pod, but not that episode specifically. But I think this episode is sort of right in the sweet spot of of the of the show where they sort of still they sort of hit the ground running a little bit, or sort of found their feet a little bit. But they'd not the the, the premise wasn't too tired yet of like the fish out of water and like the sort of mismatch. There was like a little bit of yeah mismatch buddy stuff going on that hadn't been like played out too much yet as the first appearance of the fraser senior the dad appearing as a ghost which is feels like quite a christmasy thing to do having like a, a, a like a ghost a sort of a father figure ghost and i sort of watched it again the other day and, and there's a there's a bit where they're the, the bit that i like about it is is um it's based around a heist like, and all of the, the bank robbers are dressed as Father Christmas and it's sort of set at Christmas. So it's sort of something that I like is like a heist where there's characters wearing masks. I mean, I'm wearing a Point Break t-shirt now. So it's sort of a testament to that. And it's sort of a great idea for a, for a Christmas episode of like a, a cop show type thing. And the plot itself is quite good. And there's sort of all the, the jokes around the, the, the police station where they bring in the suspects and they're basically bringing in every single mall Santa that they can find and all the elves and things like that. And there's a, a moment where I sort of checked in the credits and sort of Santa is credited. So there's there's one particular Santa that they bring in who we're supposed to believe or they, they don't really make a big deal of it, but but we're supposed to sort of read between the lines that 
that is the real they have somehow apprehended the real father christmas <laughs> at one point which i think is sort of quite a nice little touch yeah i sort of really lo- I, I like due south anyway it was sort of one of my all-time favorite tv shows and the overall arc of the series is a bit like a, a sort of a christmas film where there's a cynical character who by the end sort of warms and becomes sort of quite altruistic and kind and and i think that's sort of the sort of narrative that you get in a lot of christmas films like scrooge and christmas carol and all that kind of thing so yeah it's something i could watch probably every year and not get bored of it yeah i think i can see due south just as a whole being quite christmasy i guess because it's it's got it's got that spirit like you say uh, over the whole course of the program and it's it's always snowy because it's set in um in chicago and canada so yeah it's just a sort of it's got a little bit that christmas spirit just sort of throughout the whole thing i think so yeah, it makes, makes me want to watch that episode, actually, if I can get hold of it. <laughs> the first half of that episode is absolutely great, and it, it does sort of tail off a bit towards the end, and, and the finale happens in um in a sort of a warehouse, and it's sort of very din- dingy and dark, and, like, there's a threat of people being sort of burned alive, and it's sort of, yeah, not so Christmassy then, but they did, their concession to that was the windows of the, the warehouse, for some reason, and for no real reason I can think of, the, the light coming through them is alternating like green and red, which I guess is their way of trying <laughs> to make it seem Christmassy, even though they're all covered in like gasoline and about to be burned alive. Yeah. Oh, OK, that's good. That's a good choice. Um, definitely going to try and seek that out. You have the, the DVD box set, don't you? I, need to get I do have the DVD box set. And I've recently discovered that someone has been uploading them and sort of trying to remaster them into HD so I can I can send you a YouTube link to that oh cool well. yeah yeah i know that you. friend of the pod tim parker's got a uh, got a set as well so uh, yeah so i'll need to get him to drop that off next time he's uh next time he's around these parts and gracing me with his presence i think he's he's got one of those sort of um mid-season sets hasn't he that you get before a program is finished completely. so it's like <laughs> seasons one two and three i think and there's four on there <laughs> oh, no. I, i've been a bit confused by that before as well because there is officially four seasons but i think when it was released here, they sort of just squashed seasons three and four into one because I had a sort of oh, quick okay. look. To okay, maybe. Right. Right. Yeah, it's got the full set then. Sorry, apologies, Parker. <laughs> I uh, denigrated your DVD collection there. My wild card, the, the final choice of 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 the of the show, as it were, is um, the present. It's another Christmas present, and it's a Christmas present I received from the most famous person I know. Basically, is I haven't phrased that very clearly, but it's a Christmas present from the most famous person I know, yeah. Um, and it is, I was given uh, the Damon Hill book, My Championship Year, which was published in January 1997. So I must have got this in, at Christmas 1997. And this was given to me by uh, future Queen of England, Duchess of Cornwall, Camilla Parker Bold. Um, and Wow. And that's all I'm gonna say, that's all I'm gonna say about it. It's it, it was uh, it's a good book. I don't know where it is now. I think it's probably been given to a charity shop or something. But um, yeah, that's my wild card. You were given a you were given a Christmas present by the future Queen of England, and you've given it away. Yeah, that was well, an oversight, really. Boy, by the way, you also say the most famous person you know. Does, well, this, mean that, does this mean that there's you know a friend of the family? What, what are we talking let's about? Just, here? Or, let's just or is say it that, not to be spoken about. Let's just say that there's um we need to keep a slot open for our guests. Our guest slots open for. Uh, for the next year or so, because uh, that we could have a good Hollywood name on the books. Yes, please. OK, um, that's it. Shall we go on to correspondence? Yeah, have, OK. Because we, we put this out, as we, we usually try to do, we put this out to, to you, the listener, in advance, so you can give us some thoughts. I am going to work through the various places I have these. Uh, I don't have any paper to shake around to make the mail mail room noise, unfortunately. But um, maybe we can we can put a little bed in underneath this to make it sound like we're uh, you know make it sound yeah. like we're hard at work with with the printers and everything. Yeah, yeah, good yeah. thinking. So friend of the pod, Hannah Kelly, she 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 chose her favorite song also as um, "Stay Another Day," the seventeen song, and Home Alone, "Home Alone" was her number one film because yeah, I think both Home Alones are nineties, aren't they? So that yeah. was allowed. Yeah, her present idea was uh, not idea. Uh, her present choice was quite funny, I think, because it was uh, her and her sister. I think got a second-hand NES, but it, it brought back to her mind the uh, the way she used to buy games for the for the NES, which is very similar to how me and Adam often got our PlayStation games and our Amiga games, which was through the uh, 
the they're no longer with us secondhand dealer newspaper trade it and i'm sure you remember trade of it. of course yes yes um and she would uh, she would go and get all her games through trade it and she has a distinct memory of of buying games from random teenage boys bedrooms uh, via trade it she has a specific memory of of waiting awkwardly in some teenage boys bedroom while they dig out whatever game it was for the uh for the NES, um, and I thought that was a, a nice Christmassy image, um, <laughs> which I, I thought was definitely worth reading out. Another message here from friend of the pod, Sarah. I also yeah. like the way that we've decided now that anybody who writes in or has any sort of interaction is a friend of the pod. Yeah. <laughs> Film, she, she wants two choices. She's had uh, Home Alone, because it reminds her of when she first moved to Bristol, and she had a tradition of watching it every Christmas with, with her friends. But also, she wanted uh, Tim Burton to Nightmare Before Christmas, um, which she would choose. Hang on She's... a minute, we've, we've got a shake of the head here from Adam. What's uh, c- can I can I ask about this? Uh, yeah, I watched it again the other night just because I thought maybe this is one that I will that I will feel fondly of, and yeah, it sort of left me a bit cold really. I sort of I felt distinctly underwhelmed, and then I read the IMDb trivia about the film, and it sounds like there was a lot of rows and sort of. Tim Burton kicked a hole in a wall because he couldn't get his own boy he wanted to get his own way with a creative decision and him and the screenwriter fall, fell out during the making of this and haven't spoken since and him and Danny Elfman fell out and Henry Selick fell out and a tortured creative process eh sounds like yeah, really ap- apologize to your friend for <laughs> potentially <laughs> if she looks into that she might it might spoil the film for her so maybe she should yeah well that's I would sounds like that production was a nightmare before Christmas um Wee. but she uh she said she would she used to say it was tim burton's nightmare before christmas just trying to be cool but actually uh it scared her so it wasn't really her choice a proper choice and mm-hmm. uh for her present that she chose it was the first nokia she says who didn't love snake and having about four contacts she says it was a joint birthday and christmas present you know we've all had them because it was such a special one and she also remembers when she was younger getting a doll whose hair grew and i thought that was the best thing ever at the time that sounds kind of creepy, I think, a doll whose hair, whose hair grows. I mean, dolls in general are quite creepy. Colleague of the pod, Rochelle, said Muppets Christmas Carol was her favourite film of the 90s. So another mention for that. Other friend of the pod, Vicky. Now, this sounds like a... This uh, this sounds so 90s. I've never heard of this before. But um, this was a VHS board game. So VHS slash board game called Party Mania that she got in 1994. So if anyone has heard of this, uh, get in touch. Um, she says, this was not my favourite gift, but it was very 90s. Uh, I got a board game called Party Mania, which had a VHS that you played at the same time as you played the game. The premise of the game is that you were invited to a killer party by two cool dudes, but you have to do loads of chores before you can go. Uh, you play the game while the VHS runs in the background and occasionally someone, brackets like Aunt Franny, will call you and give you an additional chore to do. Uh, and there was a video that went with the game, and there is a YouTube link, so we'll we'll post that uh, on our social media or something. But just a screenshot from that video looks so nice. It's all day glow pink and <laughs> and, and so whatnot. And I've also been sent what looks like uh, a VHS of 911 or 911, however you say the name. The the 90s short-lived pop band, and yes, it looks like maybe this was her favourite Christmas film, or maybe her Chris- favourite Christmas present. I'm not sure. But it's very 90s, so definitely appreciate that. I think this is from Ruth Collinson, and she says her favourite 90s Christmas song. She's done the top eight here, so I'm just going to rattle through them because there's some we haven't mentioned. Wow. Just Like Christmas by Lowe. Uh, I Was Born on Christmas Day by St. Etienne. Uh, Early Christmas Morning by Cindy Lauper. Silent Night by Sinead O'Connor. I've never heard any of these. There's All I Want no. for Christmas by, by Mariah. Uh, Christmas All Over Again by Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Stay Another Day by 17, uh, and Two Become One by the Spice Girls, so you should appreciate that, Stu. Which it was not so much about Christmas, but it was released at Christmas, and I think it's another, it's two, two Become One is kind of an example of a Christmassy video, is that right? Yes, indeed, yeah, 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 yeah that's the sort of cityscape one, isn't it, where it's, it's all green screen, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and also Katie Watson said uh, on Facebook that she got a Mega Drive, which came with a three-in-one game, which contained Football Italia 90, Columns, and Super Hang On. <laughs> Super Hang On, I've never heard of. I've never heard of Columns. I remember either, it well. Actually. What is it? Columns was the um, Sega response to Tetris. So it's like a puzzle game where you, you line up the stuff and it's, uh, you know, the, 
lines appear and it disappears pretty much exactly the same as tetris super hang on i think was a motorbike racer okay um and obviously italia 90 is the famous top down top down football games but yeah remember that well i think that must have been a stock mega drive thing because i definitely remember having that uh with, with ours as well so yeah no great choice awesome and let that be proof if a proof was ever needed that we do read out all the correspondence we get so please do send us um your thoughts on this episode or any topics we've talked about before or our, our feature what's the most 90s anything you want uh i might as well read out the how you can get in contact with us now because i'm talking about it so you can find us on twitter at all right 90s email all right 90s at gmail.com or you can find us on facebook.com forward slash all right 90s and you can send us a message on there uh any of those formats we'll be glad to hear from you yeah, um, and we'll be back after Christmas with our second part of our cult, uh, 90s 11. So please do uh, get in touch with your with your own picks for that as well. Don't don't forget about that. We'll be back. Uh, we'll be back with that after the break. Do either of you have any final thoughts on 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 Christmas, specifically 90s Christmases or Christmas coming up? Just for me, just just what I'd like to say is obviously we've uh, we've started this this podcast uh, back in May or June this year, and for something that that started from me getting in touch with Alex about um, a police camera action clip. I think I think we've been doing OK. Um, you know, it's, it's been great fun to do. Hope to continue doing it for a long time. And I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who's listened, got involved, got in touch with some correspondence, to, you know, let friends know about it. Just generally, if you if you've been involved with the podcast or listen to it, uh, many, many thanks to you. We do enjoy making it and, you know, we, we will continue to do it for you as long as as long as you want us to. So, uh, yeah, please do continue to to get involved because we really do appreciate it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you to, to everyone who's listened and, and got in touch. It's uh, I've loved every every moment of recording. It and uh, yeah, I, I, I will always be grateful to you, Stu, for suggesting it. I thought you were joking when you first suggested it. But uh, thank you. <laughs> and, and here we are. It's all good, man. And a big thanks to a uh, big thanks to friend of the pod, brother of the pod, Adam Greenwood, for coming on tonight. We, it's been lovely talking to you, mate. And again, we uh, we appreciate you coming on. Oh, it's been my pleasure. OK, I think that about wraps us up. Uh, this is probably our longest ever record. So we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll leave you. Up. I like it. Very topical. That's nice. <laughs> uh, we'll uh, <laughs> we'll we'll leave you to your to your mince pies and your the, the last year Christmas shopping. And uh, we'll and your mold hooch. Your mulled hooch, yeah. We'll uh, we'll we'll speak to you in the the new year. Goodbye. Have a very merry Christmas. Take care.